Hello, everyone. Hello, Vinci. Are you ready? Good morning, Sir Aldrin. Yes. All right. Good morning. We'd like to greet, first of all, our viewers, our participants who are currently tuning in to our live um, streaming via the department Facebook page and the department YouTube channel. Mayad nga timprano kanindong tanan. Mayad nga timprano, Vinci. Maraming uh, salamat, Sir Aldrin. And uh, to all our uh, viewers and participants tuning in, if you have any questions or comments, uh, if you would like to um, if you would like to contribute to the discussion, you can do so via our um, Facebook feed, Facebook live stream, or our um, YouTube uh, account. All right, so we hope that everyone is doing well. Um, I hope that you're doing well as well, uh, Vinci. Um, we are still under quarantine technically, and I'm really happy that we're still able to push through the event in spite of what's going on. In, especially in Metro Manila or the NCR Bubble Plus at the moment. So this is our first roundtable discussion. And um, on our topic today is challenges to language documentation in multilingual contact settings. So Vinci, bago tayo magsimula, I would like to thank the Department of Linguistics through its chair, Assistant Professor Jem Javier, for organizing this event. And of course, we'd also like to thank um, Professor William O'Grady, who's on the backstage right now of the Department of Linguistics um, at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, for connecting us to our guest panelists um, this morning. So shall we go ahead and introduce our, our guest speaker today, Vinci? Yes, sir, let's go. All right, so our guest speaker today is um, Dr. Brad McDonald. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. His research interests include documentary linguistics, usage-based linguistics, interactional linguistics, and Austronesian languages. He's a faculty advisor for the Language Documentation Training Center and the Data Science Group, both housed in the Department of Linguistics at UH Manoa. He's also the book review editor for the journal Language Documentation and Conservation, and is an organizer for the International Conference on language documentation and conservation. So to share his um, experiences on the challenges and prospects of documenting multilingualism, uh, particularly experiences doing um, uh, language documentation in Indonesia, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bradley McDonald. Brad, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you all for uh, having me today. Um, I. I believe that I am ready to share my screen now. Yep, perfect. Um, okay, so um, uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to to sharing uh, a bit with you all today um, on some of the challenges of language documentation and description in a multilingual um, context setting and. I'm really going to be uh, sharing um, with you from a very practical sort of perspective, um, and so um, and so that's uh, so. So I hope that this will will generate some discussion, um, and um, and I look forward to uh, to seeing how this applies uh, to uh, different language communities in the Philippines. Uh, so let me uh, go ahead and get started here. So. Um, so based on larger discussions of multilingualism and documenting multilingualism, this presentation is going to take a look at the um, a critical look at the documentation and description that I've been involved in in two communities in Southwest Sumatra, the Busama uh, speech community and the Nassau speech community. And so this is both looking back, uh, reflecting on um, how I dealt uh, with issues of polyglossia and language contact in the Busama speech community as well as looking forward to uh, documenting multilingualism in a very different speech community, the Nassau speech community, uh, wherein I hope to expand the context in which uh, community members are recorded or documented. Um, so this is not just uh, places where people speak um, uh, Nassau, but where they speak other languages as well. And this would also um, expand to different types of documentation, um, like looking at language use, language ideologies, and uh, attitudes through ethnographic inter interviews and sociolinguistic 
um, surveys. I'll have to note that some of these planned activities um, that I have been planning on doing in the Nassau speech community have been disrupted uh, due to the pandemic. So um, when, while well, Himmelman uh, 1998 um, and others advocated for a shift away from documentation solely being based on language descriptions in an effort to create multi-purpose documentations, a major shift uh, in the field of language documentation, um, Good uh, 2018 advocates for a shift from what he's calling event-based documentations to repertoire-based uh, documentations. And so uh, event-based documentations are probably the dominant approach um, current, uh, currently used in documentary linguistics. Um, and uh, the documentation um, largely focuses on uh, the quote unquote language, but sometimes also the linguistic practices. So this is often what uh, people refer to as the lexical grammatical code, typically of the ancestral code. So we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit uh, in a bit. And these are oriented towards recording speech events. Now, what Good is advocating is a repertoire-based documentation. And this is uh, rarely, I would say, rarely employed in language documentations. And it's oriented towards language users. Uh, so it's to create transparent records, not only of the lexical grammatical code, but also language ideologies, uh, or language ideologies, linguistic ecologies, and the sociolinguistic lives of speakers, what Good calls social entailments. And so for Good, the problem is that our current methods are really inadequate for capturing language ideologies, linguistic ecologies, and the sociolinguistic lives of speakers. And I think as we all know, these areas of inquiry are critical to any study of multilingualism. So a potential uh, solution for Good 2018, one that he provides is that the target of our documentation uh, should be on the linguistic behavior and knowledge of individuals. So he says, make a record of patterns of language usage across time and social setting for a set of speakers associated with a single community rather than emphasizing any particular language of that community. So uh, in this sense, there's a greater focus on documenting the same community members in different language contexts, contexts. So this may require different types of recordings and recording setups than we're uh, currently prepared for or currently trained to do. Um, and this presents several challenges, which I'll present a little bit later in the presentation. And then link, um, other sorts of activities like ethnographic in, uh, interviews and sociolinguistic surveys of individuals to the documentation of, of the events. Now this has the consequence of limiting the number of people who may be represented in a documentation. So uh, another related framework um, by Pier Paolo De Carlo is one of two extremes. Uh, and so he talks about two approaches, an ancestral code approach and a phenomenological approach. So this first approach, the ancestral code approach, filters out uh, a single language in the interest of producing some sort of Boazian trilogy. Uh, descriptions of a lexical, uh, this makes descriptions of a lexical grammatical code much easier to produce. And uh, this sort of approach has been uh, it can be reductionist, where the researcher really decides on the composition of the corpus and focuses on a single language. So this is kind of a predetermined plan that the researcher comes in and 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 um, and uh, tries to carry out. Now, a phenomenological approach is on the uh, other end of the spectrum, where uh, the researcher focuses on observable communicative practices of a given community. The researcher doesn't develop any sort of a priori plan to document the language. Uh, and this model promotes uh, the observation of linguistic practices as they surface in naturally occurring communicative events. Now we can see that these two practices uh, are, are really extreme sorts of practices. And so it's not very helpful for my approach here, but I think it's good to kind of, I think it's an interesting uh, sort of of Klein to look at uh, these two approaches. 
while I think that a strictly ancestral code approach is reductionist and can be uh, quite damaging to a documentation project, um, a phenomenological approach is practically really difficult to carry out. And I wouldn't recommend this for uh, younger researchers, uh, especially to go into a community without a sort of plan of what you're hoping to accomplish. Um, I'll just mention briefly that there has been uh, a growing literature on multilingualism in indigenous communities, uh, where this is referred to typically as uh, small-scale multilingualism or indigenous multilingualisms. And I leave some references here, and there are references uh, in my slides um, that you can uh, take a look at if you're not familiar with these uh, already. Um, and so I just really want to note them here and also note that these uh, these sorts of studies draw on linguistic anthropological and sociolinguistic research of language contact variation and change, um, which is which is really critical uh, to understanding and documenting multilingualism. I'll note that uh, because I'm going to be focusing because I focus my research on Indonesia, I'll say that uh, discussions of multilingualism and diglossia in it are, are not new in the context of Indonesia. And there's been a number of studies on them. And we're even seeing uh, in certain subfields of linguistics that there's a recognition of the importance of this sort of work. Uh, for example, in studying word stress, uh, some uh, researchers have finally started to see that there are substrate effects um, based on word stress, where uh, depending on the speaker's native language, their word stress in Indonesian is going to be different. So uh, let's now turn to um, uh, two communities, two projects. So uh, I work, uh, I've, I've worked in these uh, two communities, the Busuma community, the both spoken in Southwest Sumatra. They're about uh, five or six hours by car from each other. It's, it's not an easy road, uh, but it can be traveled. Um, and so uh, the Busuma speech community is, uh, Busuma is an underdocumented uh, slash underdescribed, uh, but fairly vital language. It is losing some genres. Uh, so Andai Andai, which is a, a genre of fairy tales and Guritan, which is a, um, which is a genre of long sung oral epics um, are being lost, uh, but it's spoken by about 500,000 people in the highlands of South Sumatra. The documentation project has been going on since uh, since 2008, um, and uh, where I uh, conducted my dissertation research, I did some collaboration with the Max Planck Institute that had an Indonesian field station at the time, um, and the research has kind of focused on the lexicogrammatical code more or less, where I focused on phonology, grammar, uh, and discourse. Uh, although I have built a uh, fairly large uh, corpus of conversations, narratives, as well as uh, elicitation and transcription sessions. Uh, and all of this work has taken place pretty much uh, in one village uh, where I've collaborated with uh, several members of the community. Now the Nassau speech community, is a, this is a virtually undocumented and would be considered endangered language. Uh, it was completely unknown to linguists until about 2007, and it's spoken only by about 3,000 people, which in this context is really small, given that the languages around it are spoken by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and so this is fieldwork that uh, uh, started uh, more, more recently, and it's a collaborative project with uh, PhD students at UH, uh, as well as um, Indonesian linguists, both uh, junior and senior uh, Indonesian linguists. You will see a little bit later um, in the presentation. And uh, the idea is to take a broader focus in this and look at uh, sociolinguistics, language contact, phonology, grammar, historical linguistics, many other things. And, um, and there's also, in this, in this project, there's a greater focus on the documentation uh, for language maintenance uh, purposes. So let's take a look at Busuma uh, really briefly. So language ecology in the Busuma Highlands is it may be characterized as a polyglossic or diglossic uh, sort of situation where you have different Malay isolects. So you can read this as, uh, as dialects uh, in this context used in different contexts. So Busuma would be considered the, the basilect which is used around the home and in everyday uh, circumstances around the village. Um, Palembang Malay is, 
or Palembang Indonesian is uh, lingua franca, uh, spoken in market towns and with uh, for inter-ethnic communication. Standard Indonesian is used in weddings, funerals, any sort of formal events. And then you, uh, there's kind of a colloquial Indonesian or Jakarta Indonesian that uh, is commonly heard in the media and um, might have kind of special uses um, in inter-ethnic communication as well. And the Basma are in contact with other uh, closely related uh, Malay dialects like Lintang, where the speakers can uh, speak their own dialect but still be understood uh, by one another. So when I first arrived in the Busma Highlands and uh, and I you know uh, had my recorder and I was ready to to start uh, documenting the language, I very much had kind of an ancestral code sort of mindset and approach. And uh, as I was recording uh, narratives in the very beginning, I found that they were often stilted and uh, they sounded really different from what I was hearing when the recorder was off. I could understand much more of the narratives. But then when people would be talking about other things, I couldn't understand much at all. And that's because there was much more Indonesian being used. And so these recordings uh, early on uh, did not at all represent what uh, speakers, the typical speech of speakers uh, in, a, in a situation. And this was for a very, I think, looking back for a very kind of uh, uh, explainable uh, sort of reason. First, this event, this recording event, had kind of uh, qualities of both a formal and an informal event. So it was formal because, well, there's a microphone there, um, and microphones are usually used at weddings and funerals and, uh, you know, sermons at the mosque or something like that. Uh, and so in this sense, it's kind of a special, uh, special formal event. And then there was a special guest, me, a foreigner coming uh, from the outside, uh, kind of an atypical situation in the Busma Highlands. But then on the other uh, on the other side of things, I was asking them to speak Busuma, which is a very informal sort of thing, um, as well as discuss informal matters like uh, telling me a story of what they did uh, yesterday or uh, something that happened to them um, in their in their lives, uh, a special event in their lives. I also found that uh, in elicitation, I, I ran into uh, a number of challenges. So doing translation-based elicitation tasks, um, you know, I found that uh, structures were often really similar to Indonesian and in some cases appeared to be calcs from Indonesian. And I found myself continually uh, asking, is this Pusuma Indonesian or some other sort of Malay dialect? Um, and, uh, with these varieties being that they're so closely related, uh, it was really difficult um, to answer this question. And often it was just inconclusive and remains inconclusive. So uh, in overcoming these challenges, I found a couple of things helped. First, uh, time in the community, uh, just building relationships, building a mutual understanding uh, and learning the language all of these things um, helped us to help uh, people to understand the sorts of things I was interested in doing. Uh, and for me to better understand how best to understand these things and best understand how the language uh, was used in the community. Uh, learning the language, them, uh, the community seeing that I was, I was interested in the language itself um, and maybe not uh, the culture or other factors there um, that I was interested in both the language and the culture. Um, and then and a very important factor was just letting go, uh, letting go of the notions of an ancestral code ideal that I was trying to get at some perfect form or some pure form of Busuma and that, that speakers um, of Busuma will uh, mix languages and use different languages and that's part of the linguistic practices of this speech community. I did find that there were some specific things that I'll, I'll just briefly address here, uh, such as um, recording, um, recording everyday conversations really helped me overcome these challenges and really understand how Basma was being used. Um, and then once I started to analyze the phonology, morphology, and syntax based on these recordings of conversations, I, uh, I was able to understand so much more of the, um, of the language and overcome some of these challenges. 
So first, uh, recording conversations. So most of the research topics um, that uh, I pursued came from observations in conversations. So I found that when I recorded a conversation, uh, typically I, I would record these conversations by um, you know uh, either gathering a group of people together or finding some people who were already kind of chatting. And I would just ask if I could record those conversations. I would get consent. And then I would leave the recorder there and I would disappear for about an hour. And then I would just come back uh, in, in an hour or so and uh, and get the and and get the re uh, get the recorder. And so uh, what I found from these conversations is that uh, I found so much richness uh, of the languages. And I, for example, I uh, discovered um, or I I was able to uncover areas of the language that linguists hadn't known about before. So adverbial uh, universal quantifiers. Uh, which are really quite unique in the language, the structure of noun modifying clause constructions instead of relative clauses, which I haven't uh, seen in other languages of Indonesian in, in Indonesia, uh, an emerging get passive in the language, as well as post-verbal uh, negation, and there's others as well. And these are the sorts of things that if I just simply asked for translations, I would have never have found, or it would have been a long time before I found them. Uh, but um, of course, I, I didn't just stop there. I confirmed and further investigated using elicitation. And this was, this was a, um, my, my starting point for, for many of these elicitations came from transcribing conversations. So I'd get to a point uh, in a conversation where I would see an adverbial universal quantifier, and I would start to ask questions about that uh, property of the language. So uh, the analysis of the, the syntactic structures in, in language use helped me to pick out properties of Busuma and those that were of Indonesian. So if I saw something that was extremely rare or never happened in the corpus, uh, it led me to a uh, conclusion that this may uh, be in Indonesia, but not in, uh, in Busuma. And um, also, uh, elicitation and analysis was also extremely helpful in uh, teasing apart the languages and uh, and understanding the language situation a little bit better. So I developed strategies for teasing apart Basuma and Indonesian, uh, as well as other varieties. Um, and also with the, um, this was mostly done through phonological analysis, where um, I started to figure out that, that Basuma actually had less vowel phonemes than Indonesian, uh, and this would only occur in certain uh, in certain contexts. So this really helped me to kind of tease apart uh, phonological properties of words and pick out some some recent loan words and what looked to be uh, inherited vocabulary in uh, Basuma. So if we just take a look at the kind of pluses and minuses of, of my documentation of Busuma is that we see that my documentation included everyday conversations. And so this uh, is closer to documenting the linguistic practices as they naturally occur, uh, as naturally occurring communicative events that uh, DiCarlo kind of uh, pushes forward in his phenomenological approach. And there's, uh, there's less of a focus on the uh, grammar oriented documentation. So this is following Himmelman and others and a, a trend towards making uh, multi-purpose records of the language. A conversation is a great multi-purpose record of the language because uh, everybody engages in uh, everyday sorts of conversations. Now there were some minuses, some things that I missed out on uh, in documenting Busuma the way that I did with more of an ancestral code sort of approach or an event-based sort of approach. So uh, I restricted the documentation events. So I was really focused on those uh, speech situations where only Busuma was used. So uh, there, I didn't record weddings, funerals, or these other areas where Indonesian was used. Uh, I also have little documentation of the social entailments. Uh, I didn't do sociolinguistic uh, or ethnographic interviews or questionnaires. Uh, and so I have little documentation of the linguistic repertoires. So I'm gonna uh, go ahead and skip this and go straight to uh, documenting Nasal. So Nasal is uh, spoken on the coast. And this would be, Nasal is considered a, a small scale sort of multilingual situation. So different languages are used with different people in different contexts. 
So Nasal, Kaur, and uh, Busama or Samindo, which are um, very, very closely related dialects are used in everyday interactions. Uh, but these languages are not mutually intelligible. Um, so different members of the community use and understand different languages. So most people speak or understand Kaur and or uh, Busama Samenda, but only some people in these Nasal villages actually speak or understand Nasal. Um, Benkulu Malay is also appears to be used as well as some variety of colloquial or Jakarta Indonesian alongside standard Indonesian in uh, very similar to the Busma context in at weddings, funerals, uh, and sermons. So in the Nasal documentation, I plan to continue to focus on everyday conversations. Uh, and also still uh, do elicitation of grammar, phonology, uh, to produce descriptions of the language, as well as other studies uh, of uh, other linguistic studies. But I also um, plan to uh, begin to increase, um, uh, increase the, so, but in this project, I also plan to increase the level of collaboration with a team of US and Indonesian researchers, as well as uh, community members. Uh, I also plan to document goods, uh, social entailments, including ethnographic surveys and sociolinguistic surveys, um, and trying to document individual repertoires um, alongside uh, events. Uh, so there, and there, there will be a larger focus on community-driven documentation, so a dictionary project uh, that I won't talk about much today, but I'd be happy to answer questions about. So this is a collaborative project. Here's the team uh, in, in a picture on this slide. So this uh, contain, uh, this team has uh, members of uh, speak the different uh, languages represented in the speech community, um, as well as uh, as well as researchers in Indonesia um, and um, as a PhD student uh, from uh, UH. Um, one, uh, one component that I hope to add to the documentation of, of Nassau is ethnographic interviews uh, to understand language use, language attitudes, and ideologies, uh, looking at things like biographical details, life histories, language repertoire, um, language attitudes, ideologies, language acquisition, uh, and socialization. I also plan to do uh, kind of a, so these are gonna be kind of long form uh, interviews. Um, then I hope to create a shorter sociolinguistic survey that can be uh, gathered from as many people, as many of the 3000 people who live in these villages uh, as possible. And expand uh, and also provide expanded and linked metadata um, that connects the sociolinguistic uh, ethnographic interviews and surveys um, uh, that um, both uh, expands the metadata, but also links it to the recordings uh, that we make in the corpus. So some of the ways I, I hope to um, work uh, that uh, my team and I hope to uh, kind of work on this is by documenting repertoires by uh, document uh, a single location over a long period of time. So uh, for example, uh, setting up at somebody's house and then allowing uh, different languages to be used by different people as it as they arise. Uh, this of course presents several challenges. Uh, and then uh, also to try to document the set of speakers in different contexts. So speaking in both informal and uh, formal contexts using different languages. I don't uh, plan to get rid of uh, this idea of documenting events altogether. So important cultural events like Sunkuro, which is uh, shown in this picture here, um, I still want to document uh, those events and those are things that actually the community is uh, extremely interested in recording and documenting uh, as well. So I won't completely abandon this idea of documenting events. So one of the biggest challenges I think with this sort of repertoire based uh, approach is that you have less control. So uh, includes uh, 
include documentations that are more uh, unwieldy, uh, less useful uh, for research on, on the lexical grammatical code. Um, and this also challenges uh, some of the well-established consent and payment procedures that are uh, much more, uh, uh, that we can compensate people for their time, uh, as well as uh, gain consent uh, quite easily beforehand. Um, and also, it can be difficult to, to record in Indonesia outside of the village context where people aren't used to seeing uh, the recording equipment. Uh, this also has, uh, this project I just want to note, also has some community uh, driven activities and products that are, are meant uh, for the community. And so uh, just to conclude uh, this talk is that, um, so given the increased uh, recognition in language documentation uh, and Indonesian linguistics on multilingualism, uh, I reflected on both my documentation of Busma, both the positive as aspects and missed opportunities and then how I uh, kind of plan to respond at the outset of a new project to document Nassau. Um, while I'm following Good's uh, recommendations uh, more uh, closely, I still uh, don't feel like I can completely abandon an event-based uh, documentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, really rich insights and um, experiences from the Bisma and Nasal communities. Uh, just a reminder to uh, all our colleagues in the uh, Facebook live feed and the YouTube uh, live feed. You can um, you can type in your questions and comments in uh, in the comment sections of these platforms. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, our first discussant our first uh, reactor to the talk. Um, Maria Cristina Gallego is assistant professor at the Department of Linguistics of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is currently taking her PhD at the School of Culture, History and Language at the Australian National University with a documentation grant from the Endangered Languages Documentation Program. She has done field work in various communities across the Philippines and has published papers on Philippine culture history, language structure, and language change. So, uh, Ma'am Tina. Hi, thank you very much, first, for inviting me to react to Brad's talk. And I'm very happy to um, share my experience doing field work here in the Philippines. So here, I'm sharing my screen now. Um, yep. So first, thanks, Brad, for that very insightful talk. I learned so much about the um, Besama and uh, Nasal communities in Indonesia. And my initial reaction to your presentation was that it served as a very good reminder for what I have also promised for my documentation project on Babuyan Claro. Um, which is the community I've been working with for the past three years already. So my reaction to today's presentation is mostly based on my experience doing fieldwork on um, in the Babuyan Claro community. Wait. Let me just go back to my presentation. Here you go. So um, let me start by showing you this map. So just to highlight the language diversity across the globe. So many parts of the world, as you can see from this map, are linguistically diverse. But uh, sorry that I had to crop some areas. Um, and as you can see, Africa and the Asia Pacific region are the most linguistically diverse areas in the world. Um, and if we zoom in on the Philippines, the country, as you can see, is highly diverse. Um, with a language diversity index of 0.85. So what does um, language diversity index mean? So an index of one means that no two people use the same language, whereas an index of zero means that every one uses the same language. And of course, no country has an index of exactly zero or one. Um, this map is, by the way, from National Geographic and is based on the data from Ethnolog. So the Philippines is really diverse with 183 languages used by over 100 million people. I say used instead of spoken because this also includes um, Filipino Sign Language. Um, 
And such language diversity entails multilingual communities. And this is exactly what we see in the country. So communities are so close to each other and frequently interact with one another. And people are typically multilingual um, in their home or community language, the regional lingua franca, as well as Filipino, which is the national language of the country. And this is also taught formally in schools. In terms of patterns of multilingualism, you can see different kinds. So it can be that people use their different languages in different domains, for example, the home, another language for the wider community, another for the school or work. So this is where we see that languages are kept more or less distinct and separate in terms of um, use, so mo mostly domain-based. But there may also be the case that in certain clusters within the community, or the community itself that people tend to mix their different languages so the here we see that the boundaries between languages are not so clear and that speakers are less conscious of keeping the, the their languages separate there is also the possibility of reciprocal multilingualism where a person may understand perfectly another language but may not speak it and would instead respond to um the interlocutor using another language, perhaps their um, native language. And so the takeaway here is that there is no one phase to multilingualism. And that, um, as you can see in this map, multilingualism is the norm in the Philippines and actually in many parts of the world. So what I'll be sharing with you mostly um, is based on my experience documenting the language called Ibatan, which is spoken on the island of Babuyan Claro in the far north of the Philippines. Um, just a brief background on the language. Linguistically, it groups closer to um, the Batanic languages of the Batanes Islands, Itbayatin of Itbayat Island, um, Ivatan with dialects Ivasayan Isamorong on uh, the Batan in Sabtang Islands of Batanes, as well as Yami, also known as Tao, which is spoken in um, Orchid Island, Taiwan. However, geographically, um, the Babuyan Claro community located here belongs to the administrative region of Kalayan, Cagayan, in which the region is mainly Ilocano speaking, so here. And um, Ilocano is the regional lingua franca of northern Luzon. And just to note that the current between Babuyan Islands and the Batanes Islands um, is quite treacherous. And so traveling northwards to Batanes is more difficult for um, the Ibatans compared to traveling around this um, group of islands here. So in terms of patterns of multilingualism, the people of Babuyan Claro are multilingual in at least three languages, Ibatan, Ilocano, and Filipino. Although proficiency in Filipino is greater for the younger generations of um, the Ibatan speakers compared to the older speakers. Um, and Ibatan and Ilocano share a long and complex history that um, started during the early years or early beginnings of the community. Actually, Babuyan Claro is a very young community which only began approximately 160 years ago. And the first families were actually people from Batanes, further north, who have been transferred to the Ilocano-speaking islands of Cagayan during the Spanish colonial period. And they were shipwrecked on Babuyan Claro in their attempt to go back to Batanes. So during this period, um, we can expect that they had considerable interaction with um, Ilocano speakers. And also the succeeding groups who came to the island came from either Batanic or Ilocano-speaking backgrounds. Um, during these early years, the tough conditions on the island of Babuyan Claro meant that the people had to rely on each other. And so there was, um, of course, intense contact across the two ethno-linguistic groups. But ethno -rec uh, ethnographic records show that during these early years, there was still preference to marry within one, one's own linguistic group. So this preference towards keeping ethno-linguistic lines separate led to the formation of um, clusters within the Babuyan Claro network that coincide with patterns of language use and language ideologies. So Daya means East, and this is comprised of mostly Ibatan-speaking um, groups and families, whereas Laod or West um, is comprised mostly of Ilocano-speaking families. And these are um, typically mixed Ibatan and Ilocano families, so products of intermarriage. Um, more or less, the, the pattern of multilingualism here during this period was 
kind of egalitarian. Um, there was no centralized authority um, in the community yet. And so there was little to no prestige over either of the two, any of the two groups. Um, but the rise of Ilocano in phase three as the regional lingua franca of the Babuyan Islands changed drastically the language ecology of the community. And this is also the time when Babuyan Claro became further integrated into the larger region of Cagayan. Um, Ilocano became the main language of religion on the island. Then it was Roman Catholic, um, the language of education, wherein the teachers were Ilocano immigrants, and the Ibatans had to go to Calayan, the neighboring island, which is also the municipal center for further schooling. So beyond grade three, they had to um, leave Babuyan Claro. Um, and of course, governance. And this, of course, threatened the vitality of Ibatan. So the speakers were shifting to Ilocano because um, this is the language of opportunity for them. But in the 1970s, for phase four, with the help of the Summer Institute of Linguistics, the revitalization of Ibatan began. So you can see this in many aspects of the community. There was a shift to Protestantism as the main religion wherein Ibatan has become the main language for religious activities. And the Ibatans also now hold teaching positions, and the Ibatans can choose not to leave the island for further schooling. So they can now um, stay in Babuyan Claro until senior high school. Um, and of course, Ibatan is also used as the medium of instruction following the mother tongue-based multilingual education, although this is still dependent on who the teacher is. So if um, the teacher is an Ilocano immigrant who, does, who is not so proficient in Ibatan, then perhaps the, um, the medium of instruction would still remain in Ilocano. Um, the center of community activities has effectively been transferred to Daya as a result of all these changes. And Daya, as you remember, is the center of Ibatan speaking networks. So the school, the Protestant church, um, the first store on the island, um, the rural health unit, the first water supply, as well as the barangay hall, is um, these are all located in Daya, which is um, the center of Ibatan networks. Um, and also, there was a production of literacy materials in Ibatan, and this boosted reading proficiency in the language. And the most pivotal would be the awarding of the Certificate of Ancestral Domain title to the Ibatans. And all these social and political changes led to the more vigorous use of the Ibatan language. Finally, at present, Babuyan Claro is becoming further integrated into the larger nation state of the Philippines. So with improved geographic mobility, um, the Ibatans can choose to go to the mainland instead of Kalayan for um, university or for work and um, to conduct official business. And this uh, leads to less exposure to Ilocano and more exposure to Filipino. These phases, by the way, are by no means discrete and they tend to overlap. So at present, you can still see the relevance of the Daya and Laod networks, the prominence of Ilocano in the larger region of the Babuyan Islands, but also in tension with um, how certain groups within the community perceive Ibatan as their ancestral or emblematic language. So, so you can see that um, the phases overlap. And just to sum up, I needed to talk about the history of Babuyan Claro to highlight how social, political, and cultural changes crucially shape not just the language ecology of the community, but also the language itself, the structure of the Ibatan language itself. So as we have seen in the previous slide, the social linguistic landscape of Babuyan Claro is extremely dynamic. And patterns of language use change across time. Um, people shift their dominance or proficiency in Ibatan, Ilocano, and now more recently, Filipino as um, their stronger second language. In terms of structure, Ibatan has also been shaped by its long and complex interaction with Ilocano. And this is reflected in particular contact-induced features in the Ibatan language, which are not observable in the other Batanic languages. And these features are linked to different agents of change. So agents meaning speakers with varying proficiencies in Ibatan. Some are Ibatan dominant who simply transfer loan words from Ilocano onto their, non, uh, onto their dominant language, Ibatan. 
And this is the usual outcome we expect for language contact. But some are Ilocano dominant bilinguals who have imposed Ilocano features onto their Ibatan. For example, using Ilocano affixes when they speak Ibatan. And through um, the years, these changes or these patterns of use have become regularized and have um, drastically reshaped the Ibatan language. And so it is important to highlight how crucial it is to know and understand the history of the community as well as its changing language, um, language ecology in order to have a good understanding and documentation of the language. So different categories of speakers with different um, dominance or proficiencies in the same language use the particular language differently. So um, I want to emphasize that variation exists even in a small community such as Baboyan Claro. So in terms of language ideology, Daya speakers consider themselves as pure Ibatan even though recognizing their mixed ancestry from both Batanic and Ilocano families. And they tend to keep Ibatan and Ilocano distinct in um, their use. Whereas Laod speakers um, tend to mix the two languages in their um, everyday speech. And this is actually locally known as Ibacano, which is a blend of Ibatan and Ilocano. So you can see that there are different language eco um, ideologies on the island, which um, is linked to different patterns of language use. Now, in terms of who and what to document, Ibatan definitely is the ancestral code of the community. And I recognize the importance of documenting Ibatan as it is still a threatened language, um, given its position with Ilocano and Filipino at present. However, putting primacy over documenting a particular group of speakers in the community would give us an incomplete picture of how Ibatan is actually used. So we need to consider a whole range of speakers of varying dominance in um, the language. And there is a need to document beyond language or lexicogrammatical codes. So recognizing that the language ecology of the community is extremely dynamic and this needs to be documented as well. It is actually the ecology of such small scale communities that are extremely fragile and these tend to get endangered first more than um, the language itself. So documenting the ecology and the landscape of the community needs to have you know, an active community. You need to see it while it, the languages are still in, its, uh, in their active use. So um, to sum up, just to connect the context of Babuyan Claro with Brad's talk, um, I want to emphasize that multilingualism is the norm in many parts of the world, but our practices in linguistics and documentary linguistics continue to be biased towards the perspective of monolingualism. For example, when um, measuring bilingual skills, um, bilinguals are often still compared with those of monolinguals, even though we know that bilingualism is underpinned by mechanisms different from those we see in um, monolingual speakers. And in terms of language documentation, there is still the focus on documenting a single language in the community, what Brad has um, described as um, the ancestral code approach. Um, and actually, um, um, the ancestral code is often mythical. Mythical because communities are typically multilingual and people use different languages in different domains in their everyday life. And so documenting one particular language ignores the variation that exists in these communities. Actually, um, in some communities, languages may not even have discrete boundaries and people tend to mix their different languages. So we need to refine our model for language documentation that is social linguistically informed. If our goal for language documentation, as Himmelman has outlined in his um, book, is to serve as a transparent, multipurpose record of a language, then multilingual communities need new models for language documentation. So we need to extend our documentation to include social linguistic contexts and patterns of language use in order to capture a full record of the language practices of a community. So in terms of um, documentary linguistics, the discipline needs to um, consider other contexts, for example, the language practices of small-scale communities, because this will help expand the empir uh, empirical foundations of the discipline. 
Um, it is in these communities that different linguistic norms apply. There may be no such thing as a standard language. And we also need to abandon the notion of the ideal speaker. So in traditional language documentation, you need to find um, an older a speaker from the older generation who is typically not mobile, probably male, but and monolingual. But but this is a myth. All language users, dominant or non-dominant, are important. And this is where um, the social linguistic surveys and interviews, as well as ethnographic, ethnolinguistic um, surveys, come into play. And Brad has already mentioned it in his presentation. So we also need to consider speakers' knowledge. What counts as different for them? Do they feel that um, what the others, other person speaks is a different language entirely? Or do they think that um, it's basically the same as what they speak? Um, and also, we have to be reminded of our role as linguists in the field. How we treat the languages may affect how the people perceive their languages. And of course, how we document also affects the data we record. Um, for example, the specific interactional setting we are recording, who the participants are, the location, and who um, also who does the recording. So all these information, all these considerations affect the data you record and affect how people use their languages. So all in all, our documentation needs to be even richer to include all these information in our metadata. And this will then produce a true transparent, multi-purpose record of the language or the languages we are documenting. So I just want to end by quoting this um, point from the article by, by Childs, Wood, and Mitchell, 2014. Abandoning an approach favoring a single, often mythical ancestral code means documenting the variation and diversity in actual languages. And that multilingualism can be seen both as a challenge and an opportunity. That's it. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank um, the people of Babuyan Claro for their endless support during this time. That's it. Uh, thank you so much, Ma'am Tina, uh, for starting the dialogue between uh, the experiences shared by Brad and uh, the experiences in Philippine communities such as uh, Babuyan Claro. Um, so again, uh, reminding our audience members, our colleagues, to uh, just type in your comments. Uh, we are already seeing a lot of comments and um, questions in the chat. So I'd just like to keep our uh, program running. Um, I would like to introduce the next discussant, uh, Diane. Uh, Diane Manzano is assistant professor at the Department of Humanities, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. She has taught WICA 1, Language, Culture, and Society at the same university and obtained her Master of Arts in Linguistics degree from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Her master's thesis deals with the description of the grammar of Inete spoken on the island of Panay. So, Diane, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the Department of Linguistics, Sir Aldrin, Mampina, and Vinci. Thank you for inviting me. And also, of course, to Brad. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, thank you to Mampina and, and Brad. I think one of the things that struck me most while hearing the both of you is that um, uh, the, it is important to share uh, the things that you experienced in the fieldwork with people who who did the same thing so that you'll be able to know how to refine uh, documentation, your documentation practices and probably to better understand uh, your experience and other people's uh, experiences on the field. So there, um, I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint, I hope. Uh, can you see it? All right. Yeah, we can see it. Right. Let me just. Uh, right. Or. Yeah, there. So there. 
Um, uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Diane Manzano and I'm from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. I'll be talking about Inate or Inete. Um, it's uh, the language I documented for my uh, graduate thesis. So um, there. Uh, let me give you a background first of the language. So um, Inate or Inete is a language spoken by the Ati Ethno Linguistic Group of Panay Island. Uh, in the current issue of Ethnologue, the status of the language in the Igid scale is 6D or threatened with 1,500 uh, native speakers. It is, however, uh, tagged with an asterisk symbol indicating the need uh, for an updated field report of the language. Now, according to the 2010 Census of Population and Housing conducted by Philippine Statistics Authority, 227 households speak in a day. Um, the country's average household is 4.6, and this would roughly translate to 1,044 speakers uh, in, the, in the 2010 census. Now, that same census uh, also lists 51 households um, who can speak in a in Aklan. Uh, and while this number is relatively large compared to other indigenous languages spoken in Aklan, uh, like Batak with five households, Gubatnon with five households, Manobo with 15, etc. The number does not seem to bode well for Ati speakers, seeing as some of them are shifting to the language spoken by most of the neighbors, uh, which is Aklanon, or the lingua franca of, of, of Panay, which is Hiligaynon. Uh, now, in terms of genetic cl classification, um, the position of Inate in the genetic lineage is unique in that it forms an isolate group of its own. Uh, Campbell uh, defines a language, I language isolate as a language with no demonstrable uh, genetic relationship with any other language. Um, uh, it should be noted, however, that Reed considers Inate as, a, as an isolate in the PMP subgroup in consideration of his uh, proposal to reject Proto-Philippine, uh, but BLAST, on the other hand, uh, proposes a genetic classification where Inate belongs to the subgroup Proto-Philippine and yet still an isolate of that group. Now, both uh, Reed and BLAST cite the uh, protoform R to the shift in the language as evidence of it being an isolate. So there, um, as you can see in the map, uh, the map here is this. This is the southern Philippines, and this is where uh, Inati is. Okay, in Panay, there. Um, now, uh, for the language ecology of of Inate, there are three um, major um, languages spoken in Panay Island: uh, Hiligaynon. Uh, Aklanon and Kinraya. Uh, most Inati speakers are multilingual and can speak and understand any two of these major languages plus the lingua franca of the of, of the Philippines, which is Filipino. Um, some speakers who were able to finish high school or college can understand and speak English. Um, speaking English is also important to some of uh, Inati speakers since some of them um, help foreign tourists uh, go around the clan to um, uh, to for 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 their for their vacation um now again as i have said earlier hiligaynon is the lingua franca of panay since iloilo is the center of trade and commerce of the island uh, it is also the de facto language of educational and governmental government institutions media and the church so um Inete speakers have to learn uh, English, Filipino, and uh, Hiligaynon uh, for their everyday transaction. Uh, now, uh, Aklanon, on the other hand, is mostly used in Aklan uh, in some capis, in, in some parts of Capis, like Sapian and Mambusao and Antique, while Kinaraya is used in large parts of Antique, West Iloilo, Guimaras, and West Capis. Now the Ati community uh, 
uh, where I did my field work is situated in Numancia Aklan. Um, it is a few minutes away from the town proper and has a population of more or less 100 Ati inhabitants. Most of the Inati speakers in, in Numancia Aklan can speak and understand Aklanon. Um, the younger generation is also more familiar and would most likely use this for transactions outside the community like the marketplace uh, or the school since there is no established their daycare center or preschool center for Inati speaker in Numancia. Uh, moreover, several fluent speakers of Inati are aged 35 and above. Uh, the youngest speaker I talked to is 20 years old and she is studying in college. Now she only speaks Inati to her parents and her younger siblings only know how to speak Aklanon. Uh, she says admittedly that she is more knowledge knowledgeable in Aklanon even though she speaks Inati to her parents at, at home. Um, uh, the problem here, the, the problem I saw uh, in the community is uh, Ati speakers whose parents intermarried with non-Ati speakers would most likely have children who speak Aklanon. And uh, they would mostly choose Aklanon because uh, it would help their children get a job in the community and if they speak in a day uh it would be more difficult for for the children to to get um economic better economic opportunities uh so uh in that context uh uh i saw how uh uh important uh my uh tweaking my doc my documentation process should be um um, like what I agree with both Mam Pinas and Bradley's conclusion that documentation should be geared towards language use users and should therefore reflect their linguistic behavior and their knowledge. Uh, one important thing that both Mam Pina and uh, Bradley uh, discussed a while ago is to let go of notions of ancestral code ideal, which was very difficult for me to uh, to. Um, to do since uh, coming into the documentation process, I I was thinking of uh, of of this uh, uh, inate ideal that this language is should be preserved as it is, but uh, it uh, I was reminded of by both of their um, uh, presentations that you have to let go of that notion. Um, and then another particular challenge I encountered during both the fieldwork and the analysis of data is the disconnect between the actual language use of most Inate speakers and the available description of the language. So most speakers would use the ang phrase marker commonly used by neighboring language such as Iligaynon. Um, this was not noted nor described in previous literatures. I was only able to see the use of uh, the face marker ang vis a vis the established and documented guy when I analyze the contexts where these markers are used. So I think this highlights the importance of documenting the language in its current use, even though in its current use. So um, even though I would like to see how different Inati is from other neighboring languages, considering its description is an isolate language, um, I think there is still there is integrity in in documenting the language as it is used by the community right now um another important thing to note is the premium placed on the high register of inate so what mean which which is formerly described by penoyer um uh which is uh uh formerly described by Pinoyer as an endangered dialect of Inate and uh, currently analyzed by Lobel as a high re register is not used by the Ati community anymore. Um, um, a clan uh, is not used by the Ati community anymore in a clan because they said that this is used by previous Datus uh, or those from the inside or so good. 
now, Inati speakers would, would say that the variety used in Iloilo is more valued because it has lexicon and other grammar forms which reflect an older form of Inate. Now, uh, I had to deal with, with, with that kind of conflict uh, in the community where they, uh, where they see their variety as, uh, as not as important as the variety used in Iloilo or the variety used by the Datu. Um, when they said that they want that variety in their community to be passed down to, to their children. So I had to struggle and uh, um, I had to struggle and 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 uh, try to um, help uh, in documenting their variety despite the the um, the negative language attitude, not just of people outside, also people inside the community. So there, so that leads me to the next steps after my documentation. Um, local researchers are conducting revitalization, revitalization programs for Inati in different parts of Panay in uh, collaboration as uh, what is also said by uh, Brad in um, Pina is very important. Um, um, now uh, I'm looking at the steps that can be done to ensure that the language uh, will be acquired by the children, especially if, as I have seen in the field, the input would most most would most likely just come from the parents. Um, some uh, local researchers are trying to build a preschool for Inate in in Iloilo. But we're also looking at uh, how this curriculum can be better um, uh, planned and uh, um, 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 can be better planned. Uh, now, um, uh, another question would be um, if a, a plan to build a preschool for Inate would come into fruition, would there be enough? input for language to be acquired considering a multi-language a, a multilingual uh, schooling system in Panay. Now Brandon et al um, in one of uh, O'Grady's um, classes, I, I got this from one of O'Grady's classes, um, Brandon et al said that the, mo the single most important factor contributing to the development of language is input. Now we're, lo we're looking at input here not only in terms of quantity but also in quality so um, um one of the things i'm looking into or uh trying to research is um the type and the quality of curriculum for preschool in inete which would in ensure at the very least uh, a, a, no a good number of input and a good quality of input so that uh, the language can be passed down to to younger generations of Inete speakers. Um, another another challenge, so many challenges. Another challenge uh, is language att attrition, uh, which is defined by Pearson as the the L one, where the L one stops developing due to the introduction of another language, and in essence freezes in form even though the child continues to develop in L2. Now, over time, with continued and expanding use of L2, the L1 can actually be lost. Now, this is one of the uh, things that I'm grappling with since uh, one of the speakers who I described earlier, um, who is uh, now in college, um, um, learned in a day, uh, by speaking uh, the language with with her parents now when he when she goes outside uh, of the house of the domain of the house um, the problem is um, um, she her 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 
the language that she would use outside the community, of course, would be uh, Aklanon and Diligaynon. So the, the, the language trait or uh, the language that she would be most likely using outside is not the language that she uses inside the home. So there's conflict there. And um, I'm looking at how um, uh, how I how we can uh, better help her and in, in the community to 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 maintain the use of of in a day in in the community in the community. So there. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, it is inevitable that uh, Inati speakers would learn neighboring languages. And if we're looking at language strength in multilingual context, what would be a more realistic picture of a revitalization of a revitalization program? Um, uh, this is just a side note, but um, I experienced uh, resistance during my fieldwork in 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 Aklan. No? Uh, Inati speakers from different communities expressed research fatigue and vigilance against uta or mga or non ati speakers. Uh, there have been various reports of harassment, uh, including the deaths of an ati leader in Boracay. Now, these issues are connected to the commercialization of Boracay, a popular tourist destination in Aklan, where the ancestral domain of ati is. Relentless and continued discrimination by residents of Aklan and foreigners who visit uh, Boracay forces the community to be wary of outsiders. Um, citing various instances, uh, they were defrauded. So even though a more comprehensive and systematic research and description would help the, would help language revitalization uh, for some communities and maintenance of Inati in the long run, I still think that economic and political issues con continue to harm these efforts. And uh, these um these um issues should also be um should also be discussed uh in these types of conversations now i would like to thank um my inati informants and uh the whole inati community because without them i won't be able to finish my uh my my master's degree um I would like to give them. Uh, uh, I would like to to say that uh, um, their uh, their efforts and uh, uh, their efforts are 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 being uh, put out in the open, and uh, uh, we can look for other collaborators to help uh, in their. Uh, in their in their struggles to use uh, their language and their community. So there, uh Marug na adlaw kita nan uh Thank you so okay, much. Thank yes, Vinci, thank you very much to Diane for um, sharing her experience in documenting the Inete or um Inati language. I've um, worked I've done data elicitation with the Inati community in one of the provinces in Panay. And looking back, I could understand the challenges that um, Diane had encountered in her documentation. And uh, Vinci would like to thank, of course, Brad, who earlier shared us his insights on doing language documentation in multilingual settings, uh, particularly in, in two communities in Indonesia. And Tina, who shared her experience in uh, documenting the contact situation in Babuyan Claro. Now, Vinci, before we respond to the questions posted by our FB and uh, YouTube live audience, I understand now we have more than 130 live viewers on Facebook and around 30 to 40 people on YouTube. I would like to start with a question to perhaps uh, Brad and Tina because based on uh, Brad's proposal, um, one, one of them is to extend the uh, documentation to repertoire-based documentation. And this appears to require a set of additional skills. And um, now we are wondering about the feasibility of carrying out this kind of documentation individually, or um, is collaboration inevitable in this case? Brad or Tina could answer to the question. Uh, 
I could I could start us off if that's okay. Yes, Matt, please. Um, thank you, thank you for that question. Um, I I think that this is uh, I think you're on the right track in saying that uh, in these cases uh, collaboration uh, is going to be inevitable. Um, I think s some aspects of the documentation can be carried out. Um, by just understanding, first of all, the um, the kind of bias that we bring into our documentation. So this kind of uh, ancestral code uh, sorts of bias that we bring into our documentation, that's going to influence what we collect. Uh, so, for example, if I look at if I look at the uh, the case of Busama, right, which uh, was my first uh, kind of extended fieldwork experience and a place that I spent much time in. I could have easily, uh, I could have, maybe not easily, but you know, uh, without too much extra effort, I could have documented um, other contexts in which the in which the language was being used. So I could have recorded a, a wedding, and I could have recorded a uh, maybe a funeral would not have been appropriate, but I could have recorded uh, other sorts of formal events. Um, that that I just didn't record because Indonesian was being used in those in, at those events, um, and so I, I think that there are some ways to feasibly extend uh, these sorts of projects if you don't have a larger sort of collaborative project uh, going on. Um, I think it also uh, I'll I'll just I, I won't say too much more here, but I I'll just also say that. I think we can also think of this as a sort of broadening of the sorts of topics that documentary linguists go about. So uh, maybe um, certain documentary linguists felt like they had to look at the grammar or they had to do a study of the phonology. Um, but in this case, actually, uh, you could imagine going into uh, a, a community and studying some other aspect of the language. Right, so uh, doing a sociolinguistic study of patterns of language use without going into depth in syntax or morphology or phonology. Um, so, it in some ways, uh, in order to you know do a full repertoire-based sort of uh, language documentation project, what I've proposed to do with uh, Nassau, um, yes, that would be beyond the scope of just a single person. Um, and also, I think another factor is that I've lived in Sumatra for a total of three years. And so um, having extensive experience in the region and understanding how uh, the culture and uh, many aspects of, of doing field work kind of works in the area, uh, that's given me a leg up in order to start the project more quickly and, and get the ball rolling. Uh, but with Busma, it took me a, a long time to understand how to do basic things like how to reimburse people, uh, how to pay people when they work with me. You know, what's the culturally appropriate way to do that? Because a lot of times people will, um, you know, politely refuse that money. Uh, but in fact, uh, it is culturally normal to to give a little bit of something for, for their time. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think I'll just leave it there that I do think if you're gonna do something comprehensive, yes, you absolutely have to have to do, uh, have to have collaborations uh, beyond the collaborations that everyone has to have with the community itself. Um, yeah. Thank you, Brad. Tina, having done field work alone <laughs> in Babuy and Claro, you know, documenting con the context situation there, would you like to add to what uh, yeah. Brad um, shared to us? Yeah, definitely. So. Um, I think the field of documentary linguistics is really shifting towards a more collaborative approach towards documentation because you really need the help of, and input of the speakers themselves, of people in the community to have a rich documentation of, of the languages there. So, so as for my, my project, I have um, speakers from the island, from the island of Baboy and Claro who are helping me so much in terms of annotating and collecting data. So for example, if I wanna capture actual language use, if I am the one doing the recording, um, of course this would affect 
how people would use the language to me. So if I'm doing the interview in Ibatan, they would tend to accommodate to my proficiency, my competence in Ibatan. And so would use simpler structures, but it would be totally different if they are talking or if they are being interviewed by like a fellow native speaker. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I just like to emphasize that the collaboration with community members is extremely important, especially during this time. So I am currently on lockdown here in Manila for over a year now. Um, and I I was hoping to do field work last year, but then that wasn't possible because of the COVID pandemic. And so, so maintaining that collaboration, that um, connection with people from the island, um, I am somehow able to continue data collection even remotely through the help of um, yeah my friends, my host family who are still based on the island. So yeah, just maintaining these connections. And um, I would also like to pick up on what Diane has um, raised in her um, talk that there is indeed research fatigue. So if you come into the community as a researcher um, without establishing this like Impo very important connection to the community, then of course, you will never get to see how how the people actually use um, their languages. So yeah. Diane is raising her hand. Diane, yes. Uh, I just have a question uh, for both from Tina and, and Brad. Um, are there ethical considerations in, in recording, for example, um, um, conversations between speakers where you are not there. So for example, you, you can you say to um, speakers of, of, of Babu and Claro to, to record their conversations with, with their friends, for example, or their family members, uh, even though you're not there? Is that See, okay or is that ethical or are there or something like so that? So I think Diane is asking if it's okay to actually make the community work for you. <laughs> Um, response from either Brad or Tina? Probably a quick response. Yes, of course, um, you need informed consent from the from the participants. So they need to be aware that you're doing the recording because if, you know, you have to be careful if you're, like, if you accidentally recorded, like, very sensitive information. And, of course, part of documenting would be archiving these materials because you also want to have your data accessible for everyone if you want to have a multi-purpose record of the language then of course you would need to archive this and this can be accessed by everyone so so the speaker should be very much aware that they're being recorded and of course um the problem would be that you know the observer's paradox they would be conscious that they're being recorded but then later on they would get used to like the recording equipment and yeah they would revert back to their natural speech eventually yeah but yeah definitely informed consent is very important mm -hmm. and what if there are like a uh, private information in that uh in that uh conversation what would you do with a uh, recording uh yeah i've managed to record like some sensitive conversation some sensitive sensitive information and um, I had to go back to the participants in the conversation to make sure that they're okay for it to be archived. If it's um, not good to be archived, then you can put it in like like private access, wherein they can they will will be the only ones who can access the recording, or you need to be, give permission to anyone who wishes to access that kind of data. Yeah. Brad, have you encountered the same in uh, documenting Ultima yeah. and Nasal? Um, yeah, I guess um, I, I've never actually had to to do this. Um, I, I have gone back after listening to a conversation to make sure that somebody feels comfortable. Um, you know, they've brought up a topic that I thought they they might be embarrassed by or they might not feel comfortable with a lot of people listening. So I've gone back and asked just after you know transcribing the conversation if they feel comfortable with it. Um, and then I, I also uh, make sure that it's clear in the consent form that at any time, if they decide that they would no longer like to share that information, that um, that they can ask me to delete it. Um, I, I think uh, my hope, I mean, it's fairly easy to do this is to, if there's a sensitive part of the conversation, you don't have to get rid of the whole thing. 
you can simply just cut out uh, that part of the conversation. So um, I think that there are ways around it, but um, uh, yeah, typically when I set up the recordings, uh, it's, it's just that I set them up and then I usually uh, wait outside and, uh, and make sure, uh, try to uh, uh, entertain the children so they don't go uh, make too much noise in the recordings. That's my job. Yeah. Oh, just Thank one you. more, one yes, more thing. I just want to emphasize that consent is an ongoing conversation between the researcher and the participants and the community, actually, the whole community. It's not just the participants, but yeah, the whole community that you're asking consent from. So, so yeah, it's, you don't ask for consent just one time during your project, you go back to them to see how they're feeling towards you being there as a researcher or towards you documenting or recording. Um, what they do in their everyday, yeah. Thank you very much, panelists, for responding to our first questions. But before, Vinci, before we go to the audience questions, perhaps one more point from Brad, and I would like to give him also um, another opportunity to respond to what was shared by Diane and Tina earlier. Um, Diane, and, uh, Diane mentioned about how threatened Inati is in the context of, of you know, the language situation in the Panay Island. And Tina was also also mentioned about the the in, inevitability of of looking at Ivatan being also a threatened language in relation to um to to uh, the variety in Babu and Claro. So I'd like to ask Brad, um, how do you compromise or negotiate between you know documenting a multilingual multilingual practices? That is not that is letting go of the ancestral code, while also at the same time looking at the vitality of of the smaller varieties uh, involved in the community. And Brad, please uh, feel free yeah. to respond to the other points um, raised by Tina and Diane. Also, thank you. Oh yeah, um, so uh, I see lots of similarities between uh, some of the points that have been uh, discussed between the Philippines and Indonesia. Um, one one major difference. I'll just this is kind of off topic, but I'll just mention it is that I don't hear about the same sorts of researcher fatigue uh, in Indonesia that I hear about uh, in in the Philippines. Um, uh, I, the communities I've worked with have been very happy to have uh, outside researchers there, um, whether they're uh, Indonesian researchers or or foreign researchers. Um, so that's one difference just just to just to kind of note that. Um, I, I do think that this is obviously an important issue, right? Because uh, it would be a shame to go to these communities and uh, not document the languages that uh, that are endangered, right? the languages that are threatened in some way. Um, and so um, I, I actually find that the community, um, at least the communities that I've worked with, uh, kind of self-regulate that. Um, they understand that um, I'm going to these three villages in particular because what makes these three villages distinct from all the other villages is that Nasal is spoken there. While they also speak Kawar and other languages, um, they, they, speak, uh, they, they speak Nasal. So I think with the repertoire based approach, uh, basically the way to kind of um, ensure that you're focusing on a particular language or a particular part of the community, um, or that you would actually gather um, or document languages that are threatened would be the people who you ask to join the project. Uh, and to the people who you kind of seek out to uh, to record and to document. Um, and so that's been a discussion, right? Um, in the Nassau speech community, uh, the issue is that uh, Nassau speakers quickly switch to uh, Kaur, the Malayic language, if there's even just a single person who speaks Kaur, right? So it'll be very quick. So if there's a group of 10 people and nine speak Nasal and one speaks uh, doesn't speak Nasal, they'll all speak Kawar. Or, I mean, that, that may be a little uh, extreme, but the, that point seems to hold that if, you know, there's one person who doesn't speak Nasal, well, it's not very polite to speak 
Nasal when they're a part of the conversation. Um, and so, um, and so we do, that does kind of create some issues with the repertoire based approach. And so that's where I had kind of mentioned that I would incorporate elements of an event based approach uh, that, um, that, you know, um, me and uh, the uh, Jacob Hakim, who's also working on this project with me, a PhD student um, from UH, uh, where we would kind of talk to the people, the community members we're collaborating with, and we'd say, hey, let's um, record, let's find three friends to record. Um, so could we find three Nasal, people who speak Nasal to record? And then we would kind of find those people to, to, to record um, together. Um, so, so I think that this is why you kind of probably want both because yeah, there is the danger that, um, that you would be recording, you know, two Nasal speakers and one Kawar speaker in lots of your recordings, which means you would have all Kawar language. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Brad. Um, now I'd like to read one of the um, questions from the audience. Uh, this question is from Irvin Pelagio. Uh, in the context, and this is for anyone, um, in the context of language documentation in the Philippines, how important are high quality audio and or video recordings, especially for um, those tuned in who are new to uh, documentary linguistics as a subfield? Uh, anyone would like to uh, respond to that? I, I can, I guess I can respond unless, uh unless somebody else wants to, but uh, I'll, I'll just say that um, I, I think that they're of the utmost importance um, in the sense that, that what documentary linguistics has kind of, uh, you know, the idea is that we have these multi-purpose records of the language, right? And so um, what's really multi-purpose about them is that they're multimedia, that we can uh, interact with them, that speakers, uh, of or users of these languages in the future can also interact with these materials. Um, so uh, I think that we should be careful that that the the quality of the recordings that we make um, doesn't get in the way of naturalness or access uh, to to these materials. Uh, so, for example, if you uh, you can uh, buy a fairly affordable camera, and if that's what you can get with the funds that you have, then then uh, use it. Um, if you have a lot of equipment and you do lots of lots of use lots of technology, you might get some really unnatural <laughs> sorts of recordings because everyone's too nervous to talk around all this equipment. So mm. that's. Uh, so I think it's really important, um, but you have to be, you have to balance, I would say. And also just to add um, that I think more premium now is being put on um, doing video recordings over audio recordings because language is um, definitely multimodal. And if you're only recording audio, then you wouldn't be able to capture like the full, the fullness of language use by the speaker. So a large part of language is the, through gestures and you'd only be able to record that through video so yeah if the, if your goal is to have like a multi-purpose record of the language then then ideally you'd want to use video recorders for for your documentation yeah uh thank you uh let's have another question from facebook this is from one of our un undergraduate students uh neo ison uh these are two questions uh the first one is once we have consolidated the knowledge from our linguistic research, how can these go back or serve the groups and communities that we study? Uh, and the second one is, where can research on multilingualism and language documentation and uh, linguistic research in general place itself in the liberation of oppressed peoples, i.e. change of the material conditions that keep them oppressed in, say, countries like Indonesia and the Philippines? So uh, any, uh, any one of our uh, discussants and our uh, speaker can respond to these two questions. Vinci, perhaps like we could start that? with, uh, we could, perhaps we could start first with the first question. Okay, first question. Yeah. Uh, 
again, this is about how to benefit the community in terms of the output, I, I guess, right? So yeah. basically in language documentation, we get you know the outputs to the archive, but like what particular benefits um, or how do we give this back to the community in the form of research output um, that could benefit them? Yeah. I think that's a, a, a good, a, a very good question. Uh, I'll, I'll try to rephrase it a, a bit um, because I, I think that it's uh, it's not once we do the linguistic research. Um, this is actually a conversation that starts before the linguistic research uh, happens. Um, and so um, it's something that uh, you hope would be from the very beginning. Uh, and it it's really difficult to answer this sort of question because you don't really know what the community wants. There's lots of possibilities. Uh, one could just be simply uh, creating um, a bunch of recordings of events that they think are important and people that they think are important and they want to preserve. And uh, and maybe they don't have the ability to do that uh, on their own. So building that capacity could be an important step. Um, another step could be education. So providing the basis of, you know, um, education in their language. Uh, but I would just, I guess I would just say that this really is a conversation that happens with the community. Um, and I'll just say with the Nassau speech community, it's still a little bit unclear exactly what they want. Um, you know, it, and it's, a lot of it is because they don't really know what a linguist can do for them. So they're trying to ask that same question of like, oh, it's, it's cool that we have this guy who's coming from the US who wants to learn our language. We like that. We think that's nice. Um, and uh, and so, um, but we, we don't know what he, uh, what he can offer us really, but we're just happy to start a relationship. And so I think uh, from there, it's just a discussion of me saying, well, we could do a dictionary or we can make an app on your phone that has this, or we can try to make books for school and see which one uh, is most impactful for them and meaningful to them. Um, Vince, before we um, hear from Tina and Diane, I'd like to build upon that point by Brad and ask further, um, how about Bissima? Did, did I actually explicitly um, tell you what they want? And um, did you have to change you know, your plans, your research plans or documentation plans in this regard? And I hope Tina could also share her experiences in this regard and Diane also for Inati. Yeah, with the, with the Busma community, they, um, there wasn't the same concern with language maintenance. And so um, it, was, it was much more about the relationship of, of me being there with them and, and forming a friendship and um, and being a part of the community, uh, both me and and my family who who joined me uh, there. Uh, so I I think uh, in that case there is some interest in uh, seeing the the lexicon uh, that I that um, that they that we kind of built together, and um, there is a plan to um, create a book of fairy tales. Um, that I hope to share with the community in the coming years, um, but really, there, uh, it, it feels like a different situation because of the level of, of um, endangerment with that community. Yeah. Can we hear from Tina or Diane? So I think. Uh, it's important to establish first, of course, after establishing report, establish next uh, the goal of the community, as Brad and Mantina said earlier, uh, um, it's an ongoing conversation. So when I went to the Idati community, uh, we we had a talk first. So what are your aspirations uh, for Inate? What do you want? How, how do you want Inate to be used, etc.? In what domains do you want? In order to be used, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, that gives the not just the community but also the 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 field worker um, a sort of um, a baseline on how on 
what to expect, what to do, what, what is the scope and the limitation of, of, of my study, et cetera, et cetera. So there, uh, you have to establish uh, your goal and, and the community's goal uh, first before you go into uh, uh, saying that this should be done or this should be done, et cetera. It should be, yeah, an ongoing conversation. Yeah, just to quickly add that um, part of the research fatigue um, from some of these communities in the Philippines come from the fact that for many years, the researcher just goes to the community to take information, take data, and the community feels like they, like these not uh, the their indigenous knowledge is being stolen from them because mm -hmm. nothing is coming back to them. Okay. So yeah, you have to really be mindful of what you give back to the community. So again, um, just to point out that this is an on ongoing conversation. And um, one of the good things about doing collaborative research is that you're building capacity in the community. So if you ask um, assistance from people in the community itself, then you are um, training them to do linguistic research, which they might be interested in exploring further. So I've been very fortunate that um, I came to Babuyan Claro, um, which is a community that is al already so used to um, a linguist being there with the um, Summer Institute of Linguistics. And um, the missionaries actually have helped um, empower the community so much. And that they know that um, it's good to, uh, the people themselves know that it's um, a good way to collaborate and that they're actually being trained to, to in terms of linguistic skills. So they are the ones actually who are documenting, building their dictionary, um, yeah, producing materials in, in the Ibatan language. So yeah, that's like the ideal, the goal of um, doing documentation with collaboration. Very good insight. Can, uh, oh, sorry, can I add one more quick thing that yes, I just please. thought of is that, is that uh, I think one thing that we, well, Part of these activities are professional for us um, that we are, you know, writing papers and doing uh, presenting these things professionally. Uh, when you live in a when you live in a, a small community and you become a part of that community, it's personal, and these are personal relationships. And so, um, you know, it's it's about giving back, but it, it's also about staying connected. And so, if you start a project with a community. To me, it's in some ways, it's a lifetime commitment to that community in so many ways, um, because these are people who are investing in your life and you're investing in theirs. And so it's it's really about, uh, you know, a lifelong sort of relationship with these people. Indeed, commitment is, is a key word. Uh, Vinci, can we now proceed to some of the other questions yeah. from the audience? Yeah, this is somehow related to uh, one of the last points. Uh, this is from Ronel Laranjo. Uh, maybe this can be uh, sort of your anecdotes on your first encounters with these communities. He asks, how did the people in the communities welcome or treat you as language documenters or linguists? What are the, what are the first encounters like? <laughs> maybe that's the gist of the question. Uh, Ma'am Tina or Diane, Brian? Then go yeah, ahead, uh, Mr. Racing. Okay. I, I'll go ahead, okay. Um, so um, I visited three um, communities for, for my, for my uh, uh, graduate thesis. And of course the first one, uh, the Numan Sa'aklan, uh, they, they were very welcoming, and um, I think um, that uh, you have to remind yourself that um, uh, it is not always going to be like that all the time in all the communities that you're going to uh, uh, establish rapport with. So, uh, in just was just as what I have said earlier, uh, I experienced uh, um, wariness uh, when I visited uh, some of the communities because uh, they experienced um, yeah research fatigue. 
So um, that was difficult for me uh, since uh, I had to be very, uh, I, I have to be more considerate to the uh, the community, of course, because that is their community. Um, but uh, you have to be uh, you have to be mindful of uh, of their um, of their of their situation, and uh, not to take it too personally <laughs> uh, when you're not that uh, when you didn't feel as welcome as you did in the previous communities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there. I guess Any I can go next. Point? Yes, I can. Now. Yeah, I can go next. Um, the Baboyan Clara community, they're very welcoming. But of course, because I'm an outsider coming to the island and they know that I'm going to document their their practices and that I am someone from academia, then of course, in the initial um, maybe week I was there, of course, people were quite uncomfortable around me. So um, there is a need to um, highlight that um, as, a, as a researcher doing documentation, it would be ideal if you can stay longer in the field so that you can establish rapport with the community. Because um, the longer you stay there, the more um, people get comfortable in your presence. Um, and I recognize that this may not be possible for, for some of us who are only able to do field work in short periods of time. So it would be good if you can go back to the community and not just, you know, go to the community, spend a week there and leave. Um, I guess people became more comfortable with me when um, it was my second time on the island. The first time I left, um, Babuen Claro is quite isolated and it takes about seven to 10 hours on a, fish, a small fishing boat to get to the island. Um, and um, it's quite treacherous, the current. So, so when I went back to the island, the people were really like happy to see me and they were joking that, you know, oh, we thought that you won't come back here anymore because the, it's just too difficult to, to, to travel here. So, so just showing that you're really dedicated to your work and the community, then it would mean a lot and it would make, you know, uh, establish this um, connection to the, to the community. So, yeah, and um, the moment I felt that I was almost like a part of the community is that when people started to describe me as, uh, you're already an Ibatan, Ibatan dana, because I could all, already understand the language and that they would joke, oh, di ka na you, um, because you can understand the language and you know that you're, um, they're talking about you. So, so yeah, once, once they've started to describe you as um, one of them, then, you know, that's like very fulfilling as a, as a researcher. In the field. Yeah. Di ka na mabibenta means you cannot be sold anymore. That's a common expression when you learn another language in the Philippines and, and people would always say that um, just for, for Brad. <laughs> Brad, would you like to add to that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, highlight exactly what's already uh, been said is that I think that uh, time in the community is so important. So if you're able to go for longer periods of time, if you're able to bring family members, uh, children, if the spouse, things like that, um, that's also uh, something that I found that uh, the community um, uh, really appreciates that you share your kind of whole life with them. Um, I The idea of going back to the community, that's where I think it's really key is once they see that you're committed to this so that you leave and then you come back that shows that you have that relationship so in indonesia i'm i'm sure this is uh i'm sure there's something similar in the philippines but in indonesia you have ole ole which is um which is uh what you bring when you come back from a trip or something like that uh the little a little present then Usually the present is insignificant. It's a piece of, it's some candy or some special food or, you know, at most a shirt or a hat or something like that. Uh, but that's what most people focused on. And I thought, huh, did they, but it's not that they care about the material thing. It's that they want you to come back. And that's what's so important uh, in, in, the, in the communities. Uh, I, I was, um, 
my first experiences in um, in these villages uh, that I've I've lived in in Indonesia are overwhelmingly positive. People are excited for for you to be there. Um, they're also just as much as I was nervous, you know, uh, talking to new people, meeting new people, being in a new place that I'm really unfamiliar with. They were also just as nervous to talk to me, right? Uh, they didn't know if I was going to be arrogant or rude to them, or if I wouldn't accept them or anything like that. So I found that this is a lot of times a, a, a two way street. And so thinking about how they're feeling about you being there is an important thing to keep in mind. Thank you, Brad. Vinci, could we probably go now to, the, to our last round of questions from the audience? Okay, uh, this question comes from one of our uh, PhD students, Hanilet Dumoran. Uh, what recurs in the discussion is the role of the researcher in what he or she finds. How important do you think is it that we move from traditional documentation methods, i.e. monolingual communities, uh, the so-called ideal speaker, and towards more integrative methods? Um, anyone would like to take that question? I can just uh, say that um, I think it's extremely, I think it's extremely important. Um, I think that the, even in the time that I uh, started uh, doing field work uh, until, um, until now or a couple of years ago, um, the world has changed a lot um uh and so uh the how integrated we are how the access to communication uh is changing all over indonesia um and so um the i think the expectations i see from from the indonesian communities to the indonesian government to indonesian collaborators uh, all of that has changed uh, drastically so it's no longer the sort of um, it's no longer the expectation that a foreign researcher goes into Indonesia, does um, his or her research, and then leaves. That's no longer um, possible, really. Um, and and uh, and and because uh, Indonesians see that that's not good. Uh, for uh, building capacity, uh, not just in the communities that we're working with, but in the country as a whole. Um, and so um, we're seeing much more collaborative methods, methods where training and capacity building is at the is at the center of the uh, at the center of the, the research project. Um, and so uh, you can't even get a, a research visa in Indonesia without a true collaboration. So it's not just somebody willing to write a letter for you, but a, a collaboration where you co-author and, and do research together. So, um, yeah. Yeah, we need to move away from um, this traditional practice of like treating languages and the communities um, as relics or as artifacts that we can display in museums. So, so the good thing is that there is a shift away from that practice and that we're yeah, moving towards a more collaborative um, kind of, of um, linguistic practices. Um, and also, yeah, I want to use this buzzword um, in academia now that we need to decolonize really our practices. And it's not, we don't, uh, we shouldn't treat communities or the speakers or the participants as working for us, but we're working with them to document their language. So, so yeah, it's really um, important that we um, practice collaboration instead of us going to the community and just imposing, you know, our values and yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I would also like to add uh, the importance of integrating not just the community that you're um, working on, but also the, the outside community. So, for example, uh, I'm I'm working uh, with the Inati community, and at the same time, also collaborating with Aklanan speakers, Hiligaynon speakers, um, um, other speakers in the area, since that would help as well. 
your community if you if you if you collaborate and you integrate um, uh, them to to the to your efforts. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we're uh, running out of time, unfortunately, but the discussions have been so fruitful and uh, really rich. Uh, thank you so much for uh, all of you who joined us. Um, for those who still have questions, we can still send them to our um, discussants and our speaker today. You can send them to our uh, department email, which uh, you can find in our Facebook page and also I think in our YouTube uh, channel. So at this point, I'd like to uh, I'd like to um, award the certificates of appreciation and um, attendance to all uh, of our guests today. Um, so first of all, I'd like to um, I'd like to award this certificate to um, wait. Vinci. Um, yes, I, Jen is supposed to read the citation based on the information ah, yes. shared earlier. So. Perhaps we could bring him um, in the studio. Sir Jim. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, I would like to thank um, all of you who tuned in to this morning's virtual roundtable discussion. Uh, many thanks to Dr. Bradley McDonald for imparting his knowledge and experience in documenting Basamah and Nasal. Uh, thank you, Professor Maria Cristina Gallego and Professor Diane Manzano for sharing your insights on their documentation projects. Um, thank you, Dr. Alvin Lee and Professor Vincent Christopher Santiago for moderating today's event. Um, at this point, I would like to read the citation uh, in the certificate that we'll give um, to um, Dr. McDonald. Um, University of the Philippines, Diliman, College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, Department of Linguistics. Um, the Certificate of Recognition is hereby given to Dr. Bradley McDonnell of the University of Hawaii in Manoa for delivering a lecture titled On the Prospects and Challenges to Documenting Multilingualism During the Challenges to Language Documentation in Multilingual Contact Settings, a virtual roundtable discussion organized by the Department of Linguistics. Given this 29th day of April 2021, signed by yours truly, Coincidentally, today we are also commemorating the 74th birth anniversary of the late Professor Emeritus Jonathan Maliksi. Um, we remember him through the research outputs, extension projects, and academic activities such as um, this one. Uh, thank you. Stay safe and uh, well. Thank you very much. Good day. Thank you very much, Jem. Uh, and thank you very much to our audience who joined us today. We have um, participants from all over the country, Vinci. Yeah, thank you so um, much to all who tuned in. Yes, and thanks as well. Special thank you to um, Dr. William O'Grady. I'm not sure if he's still in the backstage right now, but he's the one who connected us to um, Brad. So thank you very much, William. Hello, you're still there. <laughs> Would you like to say something, William? Uh, just that I really enjoyed the, the conversation. I'm really happy just to be able to sit and listen and learn. Thank you all for, for what you did. Thank you. Thank you once again, um, Dr. Brad McDonald. We hope to um, hear from you again soon on the updates on your work yeah. on Busama and Nasal. Um, exciting, ex really, really exciting. Um, uh, years ahead, we hope the situation would get better because I know that the pandemic is really a huge impediment uh, to many of the works that you do. And also to Tina, um, uh, are you still going back to Babuy and Claro um, anytime soon? Maybe not this year. <laughs> not this year, yeah. Um, again, hopefully if the situation gets better, you get to go back to the community again. Definitely. And then thank you as well for your work yes. on it, they were excited to see more works uh, at your end. Vinci? Uh, one final thing, uh, for those of our uh, audience members who would like to have a certificate of attendance, you can uh, answer the, um, the link up to 5 p.m. today. So uh, please do not forget, <laughs> thank you so much. And also right, our uh, Philippine Linguistics Congress, Sir Alvin happening uh, yes Vinci yes please August. feel free to share information about it uh, Philippine Linguistics Congress is happening the, um, online uh, this year 
in August. All right, and we will have a special panel dedicated on um, well, docu language documentation, right? Okay, and one last thing. This is not the last um, the roundtable discussion that we will have, which is kind of like through the um, assistance of Dr. William O'Grady. We'll have another um, uh, discussion, which is going to be held through uh, the linguistics um, uh, special lecture series. And this is going to be on developing literacy materials for indigenous languages. And we are going to have Dr. Keao Nesmith from the Department of Linguistics also of the University of Hawaii in Manoa to be joined by two of our colleagues in the Department of Linguistics. We'll announce the details of this um, uh, lecture um, soon. Jem, do we have information already on the date? So yeah, they can uh, just wait calendar. for the pop months. <laughs> but uh, definitely right. it's going to be in May. It's going to be on the first half of May where we're going to release the publication material, uh, material about this um, really soon. So again, thank you very much for joining us. This morning, it's already lunchtime here in the Philippines. It's already evening there in Hawaii. So thank you again, William. Thank you, Brad. And, for, and thank you, Tina, Diane, Vinci. Thank you so much for joining um, this morning. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.